Hey everyone, David C. Anderson here coming at you from the Knife Center and welcome to Knife AQ. Number 78 is this episode's number and it's the knife series where we answer your questions whether they're sharp or dull. This week, talking about a few things including how my move has been going, the importance of edge maintenance which is very important, spoiler alert, and what is the point of a neck knife after all. Let's get right into it. So if you're new to this video series, the deal is leave your questions in the comments section below and we're going to pick some good ones to pull out and answer in future episodes. And thanks everyone for uh, sticking around the last few weeks. It's been a few weeks since we've had a full length Knife AQ episode. As uh, we posted a short a little bit ago, a short video, I am in the little bit in the middle of a move right now. So thanks for everyone for your uh, well wishes there and wanted to talk about first the question that was posed in that short as to which knife I was going to not pack for the move. What, what was, I, was I going to keep out to kind of see me through? Uh, well, first part of the move's done. We haven't moved into the new place yet, uh, but here's what I had uh, selected to pick from. Few options. I was thinking either something like the bomb proof reliability of a Sebenza. There's very little to go wrong here. It's sturdy. You can use it really hard. The Insingo blade shape on my Sebenza 21 right here is fantastic for cardboard work, which of course there's going to be a lot of that. And contrary to what some folks said there, I'm not afraid about mucking this uh, knife up, using it hard. As you can see, it's not too fancy. It's already been used quite extensively. This would be just another chapter in its story, shall we say. But the thing about that reliability there is it's one less thing I might have to worry about as the move drags on, which they tend to do. Uh, the, uh, speaking of along a similar line, my Delica and K390 steel. Go for something with really long edge retention, right? Because one less thing you have to worry about, sharpening in the interim. And of course the Delica is just a cardboard destroyer with the full flat grind and with this steel especially. Works great, grips well, very little to go wrong with this knife as well. But in the end, I did wind up going with my bug out. It's one of my most used knives and I went with it for that reason. There's a muscle memory with this knife. I'm just, I'm so versed on getting it out of the pocket flicking the blade open, making a cut and getting the knife away we, all with one hand. And there's something to be said for that. Something you're very familiar with and something that you know works for you. The edge is going to last long enough. I think it's still got a great thin blade for the cardboard stuff. Admittedly, there's a little bit more to go wrong with this knife than the other two. You know, you've got, you know, the Omega Springs in there, which I've always had good luck with, but some folks worry about those breaking. I understand that. And in the end, as you can see, I'm actually missing a screw right here on the front of the knife. It didn't in, uh, impact the performance at all, but that's just the perils of, you know, swapping your scales for something non-factory like I did with the uh, Flitanium Crossfade scales here. Didn't drop a little bit of blue Loctite on that thread when I re-screwed things together, and that's on me. So now I gotta find a screw somewhere. <laughs> um, They're very small. There, yeah, I mean, I'm not finding that anywhere. Oh, you know what I did find? If you guys remember uh, several episodes back, I found a, a handle to a kitchen knife, but the blade had snapped off. The other day, I was cleaning out my office, cleaning out the closet in there, and I found this. This was a kitchen knife. I have no idea where the blade to this is. I did find the, uh, the remainder of the blade when I was cleaning out a closet. Um, so that, that is what I, I kind of made the pick for, is that bug out. But that's not the only knife I wound up having on hand for reasons you'll, you're about to hear. When you, once you've been buying knives for a while, they tend to just kind of materialize. <laughs> like things get set somewhere and you don't think about it and they get rediscovered. And that's what happened when I was cleaning out the garage and I found my Buck 110 Slim out there. It was my toolbox knife for my uh, rolling tool cart. So I snatched that. This was great because I was able to use it just really indiscriminately on boxes. I didn't have to worry about, you know, babying it or anything like that. And this was also a great handout knife. Had some folks come over to help us, some good friends. And I was able to say, here, break down that box of cardboard over there or that pile of cardboard. They were able to take this, get the job done. It's really awesome for that. 
Yeah, this uh, this thing got put through the ringer. The edge itself definitely has some uh, some rolls and some some damage from the uh, abuse we put it through. So that'll take a little bit of attention when it's time to uh, get that back to snuff. Uh, I did also have my Nordsmith Canteen knife around just in case I needed to make some heavier cuts, but also primarily I kept this around to use it for food prep stuff, which was really good thing because we uh, had to spend a few nights in a hotel and the only food prep uh, knives we had in the kitchenette there were a couple of micro serrated steak knives and one of them even had a busted handle. So that was, it was real nice to have this on hand to be able to do some, uh, some cutting board kitchen work there. I'll, uh, I'll see if I have a picture I can send, get to Thomas so he can show you the alternative that I had there. And you know, because I'm a knife guy, I, had, you know, I may have had my BK-20 in the vehicle just in case something needed chopping too, but didn't, didn't wind up using that. So thanks again, everyone, for your well wishes. That's kind of the knife story of at least the first part of the move, uh, and we'll go from there. Fortunately, I did, I moved most of my knives here into the office, so if I needed to, I could get in and make a swap, but neither here nor there. They're over there. They're over, yeah, yeah, that's correct. <laughs> very good, very good. All right, first uh, official question today comes from Imagines. What's the point of a neck knife? It's this bit here on the end opposite the handle that's a little bit sharper, a little bit pokier in general. I kid, of course. I, I understand uh, the the spirit of the question, because if uh, at, at first glance something that you would carry around your neck seems like it could be a little bit impractical for most common uses day to day uh, or common uses today, and I'll admit it's definitely a bit more of a niche carry style. But there are some pretty significant advantages to it if you need what that's going to bring. Um, I'll start actually with, that's a Spyderco arc by the way, but I'll start with something a bit more traditional. And this is the Kellum Noita Puko knife right here. And while they may not be the first in history to carry knives around the neck, the kind of Nordic culture has a lot of history using traditional knives like this as neck carried knives. And they would be carried in a leather sheath with the tip pointed down. This comes with a sheath that could be used neck style. It has a simple thong right here. So it might not be obviously set up as neck carry, but this works uh, for kind of illustrative purposes here. And one of the reasons for a neck knife in those cultures that still has applicability today is heavy winter clothing. If you're trying to keep bundled up and warm, a knife around your neck is gonna be a lot easier to get to and let a lot less heat out than if you had to you know, pull up your uh, the, the edges of your coat to get to a belt mounted knife. So you could easily get to that small knife there, do what you need to do without exposing yourself to the cold as much. And this is at least an anecdote I've heard. Same culture, if you know, you're you worried about falling through frozen ice and into the cold water below, if you're barely hanging on, you might be able to get to this neck knife and use it as a bit of an anchor, like piton essentially, to help pull yourself out. I don't have any documented examples of that, but it is something I have heard over the years. So I'm not gonna try it. Worth mentioning. Yeah, you sure? No. It could be a good video. You first. You always say safety last, like content first. Uh, safety third. Safety third. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> safety. Eh. <laughs> so there, there are some uh, some good kind of traditional uses there. Sticking with the outdoor uses for a minute, there can actually be an advantage without the pack if you are carrying the knife inside your shirt, which is a common way uh, that, you know, there's a, a tactical aspect for con the concealment there, but not in this particular situation. If you're kind of tromping through woods, especially if you're uh, moving through brush, not on an established trail, much less likely that the knife inside your, uh, underneath your shirt is going to get snagged and you're going to lose it, as opposed to a uh, belt mounted sheath knife or even a uh, pocket knife. A clip can get snagged and have that knife pulled away out of your pocket real easily. So there's a security aspect to carrying it that way in that situation. Now, before I move on to the quote unquote tactical thing I just mentioned, I just want to take a moment to appreciate this Kellum a little bit more. I love Kellum knives. It's about 130 bucks for this one. You've got a birch, curly birch handle, reindeer antler bolsters there on the end. You can see the bark. Very cool. Carbon steel blade, I think. Uh, no, this is not a laminated blade, uh, but it's just a, a fine looking carbon steel implement, great wood carver, 
so, so comfortable too. But anyway, I digress. On the quote unquote tactical aspect of a neck knife, it's all about concealment, especially something like this Spyderco Arc that I just mentioned, which uh, is about 82 bucks for this. Uh, I've got a sheath for it here and it is very slim. Yeah, I'm putting it in the right way. So it is very concealable inside the, uh, the shirt when carried that way. The downside of a uh, neck knife in a tactical situation is that it, it can be a little bit slower to get to, so you don't have the speed of access, but that's the trade-off you make for the concealability in that case. And when you go with something real lightweight, like the Spyderco, you could be wearing anything. You know, if you're going for a jog or something and you're in athletic shorts and a t-shirt, you don't have to worry about the weight of something on your hip dragging you down. And in fact, this knife was designed to be worn even without clothes. This is the always ready knife and was designed to be able to be carried in the showers, in the military. I'll let you draw your own conclusions there, but that is the point, or those are some points anyway, of a neck knife. Hope that helps. All right, Carmine Trento asks, hey DCA, hope all is well. My son's birthday is coming up and I am contemplating getting him his first knife to learn how to use and take care of. I know in previous First Kids Knives videos, you've been a big proponent of the Buck Bantam. I was wondering with the influx of new models, such as the new lighter weight 112 Rangers and a multitude of smaller D2 or similar knives, has this at all changed? Thanks. Yeah, so I'm, I would honestly stay away from most D2 knives for this particular uh, use scenario uh, because learning how to sharpen can be hard enough as it is and you don't want the steel to kind of be fighting against your son as he's trying to learn how to do that. D2 is a great steel, but it is not, uh, you know, it has a reputation for being more difficult to sharpen. So for that reason, I tend to kind of not consider a D2 knife for this type of environment. But the 112 Slim Select, I actually think that is a great option. I mean, you already know I love the 110 Slim Select. I talked about it earlier. This 112 has a lot of what I look for for a quote unquote first knife, first kid's knife especially. You've got a short enough blade, it's three inches, good enough size without being unwieldy. You've got finger guard protection, more so on the Ranger than on the Folding Hunter. That works really well. You've got a locking mechanism for safety, which I definitely appreciate. There's something to be said for learning how to control a slip joint, yes, but I, I tend to go with the safety of the lock in this case. And it's a lock that encourages two-hand closing. So less opportunity for shenanigans, shall we say. You have to consider what you're doing a little bit more than on, for instance, a Benchmade bug out with something like that axis lock. Definitely prefer that for something like this. It's also, you know, USA made, which is a nice bonus. And this is also a knife that can grow with him. You've got you know, everything you really need in a pocket knife. You've got ambidextrous opening, you've got the lock, you've got the pocket clip. It's going to work for a good long time. If you want to hear any of my other thoughts on first kids knives and some more on what the uh, criteria I'm using to base these recommendations on, we'll make sure to leave a link to that video up there. Yeah, over there. There we go. Uh, hope that helps as well. Next question comes from Jamin Klingensmith. 1095 versus CPM 3V for outdoor heavy use knives. Honestly, you can't go wrong with either. Each one has a, a set of advantages and disadvantages, but both are good options. If you want the most performance, go with 3V. You're going to get longer edge retention. You're going to get a heck of a lot of toughness with a steel like 3V. And if that's what you want and you can afford it, go for it. I'm not going to stop you. In fact, I would probably encourage you, not because I want you to buy a more expensive knife, but just because I want you to be happy. And if that's what you want, go for it. Now, disadvantages of 3V, it can be well, it is harder to sharpen than 1095, although 10 or 3V seems to me to be one of the particle steels that's not as hard to sharpen as the performance you get out of it. It seems to weigh more heavily in the actual performance while being easy enough to maintain. But the other disadvantage is, of course, cost. This Bradford Guardian right here, 5.5, is about $243. It's a fantastic knife, but that is a lot of money for something that you might be taking out and using heavily. There is something to be said for a less expensive knife that you're not going to feel guilty about thrashing. Again, talked about that when I talked about that 110 Slim from the beginning of this video. Didn't have to care that we were treating this knife very poorly because didn't cost as much. 
Uh, and that's where 1095 can present an advantage. I've got a Becker BK 10 right here. It's about, uh, about 110 bucks. Similar blade lengths overall, a little bit beefier, thicker construction on the Becker, of course. Fantastic knife here. Even if you're not worried about, uh, if, if you're still going to take good care of this and not worry about thrashing it, still a great option there. But you really could beat on this a bit more heavily with less compunction about, oh, I'm ruining a really nice thing. These things were made to soak up abuse and look good doing it, I might add. And as mentioned, the 1095 is going to be easier to maintain. Uh, one, one advantage of 3V I didn't mention, 3V is not a stainless steel, but it is, of course, more stainless than 1095. Although the uh, blade coating here on this Becker certainly goes a little way to mitigating that concern. Take your pick. Honestly, there's, there's no wrong answer here. I would say just go which, with whichever of those sets of parameters I laid out feels better to you, then that's the right choice for you, I should think. All right, let us now move on to the lightning round for today. Jelly Roll 28. Uh, hey guys, long time listener, first time caller. Are you just listening? You should probably watch too. How did he call in the middle of a YouTube comment section? There's just some new technology going on here, I guess. I was wondering if stropping a V edge is possible and or worth it. I'd say it's absolutely worth it. A good strop, especially if you've got some compound on it, this particular one right here does not. And I'll tell you what this is. What is this? This is the uh, Garros Goods double-sided paddle strop, about $34. And you could load it with the compound of your choice. But a, a good strop is absolutely the best way to put the final or as the final step in your sharpening process. Whether your secondary bevel on your knife is flat or convex, whether you've got that V edge or whether it's got a little bit of that convex curvature, it's gonna work great. Works great on Scandi grinds, works great on full convex grinds as well. Yeah, definitely learn how to, uh, to use one of those. When I did, it was kind of game changing. And if you want more information on actually how to do that, we do have a stropping video we can point you to, which will also go right up here somewhere. Roughly. Roughly, approximately. Um, yeah, absolutely worth it. Check it out. All right, Wiggly Wriggly Do. <laughs> I didn't read his name at all when I, I just read the question. I was like, oh, that's a good one, Pop. I gotta see if I can just start hiding usernames from you. <laughs> Uh, how much burr do we ingest from foods processed with knives? What's the safest steel to use for food processing? Uh, I hear where you're coming from, but this is probably a situation where it doesn't need to be uh, overthunked so much. Um, but that's one reason to strop your edges to get rid of that burr. Or as you're using it, learn how to use a kitchen steel real well to keep the edge aligned. If any little bit of, uh, you know, tiny little bits of metal right there at the edge are coming off into the food. Not really anything to worry about. It's like taking iron supplements, so to speak. Uh, but it doesn't matter whether you're using a high tech stainless super steel or an old school carbon steel. I don't think any of them are like unhygienic or unsafe. So I'd be more worried if the knife was dirty. Clean your knives and use a food safe lubricant if you're using any kind of lubricant. Uh, next up, the power within says, Hey, Knife Center, I've noticed a lot of different companies using S35VN recently, originally made by Crucible Industries, and I'm curious if companies wanting to use a steel designed by another company have to pay them to use the recipe for that steel. If not, any info on how that works? Thanks a lot. So these companies that, uh, you know, you, you're getting S35VN on all kinds of stuff nowadays, from high-end American stuff to, you know, sub $100 imported stuff nowadays, and they're not making the steel they're buying the steel from Crucible. They're not paying a royalty to make it themselves. They put an order in with Crucible or with a distributor. They ship them sheets of steel and then they turn them into blades and put them on knives and send them out. So that, that's how that sort of thing typically works. Uh, it's like the name brand. S35VN is a name brand, that's Coke. Um, well, better example. D2 is Cola. K110 is Bowler's version of D2. It's metallurgically the same, but they call it K110. That's their brand name, so that's Coke. Other D2 is cold. Make sense? I'm thirsty. Ooh, I could go for a Coke. All right. Now, finally, instead of a most serious question for today, we are going to revisit a little bit of an old question with your help in this case. And we're calling this segment, Measured Once, Cut Twice. 
And yes, I had to practice saying that because I kept wanting to say it the real way the idiom goes. Uh, but anyway, this is in response to a few weeks ago. Uh, we had someone write in who had a friend who was disappointed in the edge retention of his knives while making beef jerky. And I made a couple recommendations, but one I left out that you folks recommended, and I think was a phenomenal option, was the Benchmade Meat Crafter. My, uh, my final pick there here was the Felicneven Butcher Knife, which I still think is a phenomenal option, but I somehow overlooked the Meat Crafter. This thing is going to be great for hours spent making jerky. Now, if you go with the uh, standard version with the rubber handles and the CPM 154 steel, probably not going to see dramatically different edge retention than the VG10 on this Felicneven, but the S45VN on this particular upgraded version of the Meat Crafter will certainly give you more edge retention. You've got that great sweep, that great thin grind that is just, I mean, it's right in the name, Meat Crafter. If you're making jerky, this is definitely worth a look. Other thing worth mentioning that I didn't talk about that several in the comments did was make sure your friend is not cutting on an improper surface. Make sure he's cutting on a good cutting board, not something made out of glass, not on a countertop. And that right there might go a long way to solving his edge retention issues. All right, that is all we've got for today. Make sure to leave your questions in the comments for a chance to have it featured in a future episode. And we're still doing the most serious questions of the day as well. So if you've got some of those questions, make sure to leave them below also. If you want to get your hands on any of these knives, we'll have links in the description. And that'll take you over to KnifeCenter.com. Make sure you sign up for our Knife Rewards program while you're there so you can earn some free money to spend on your next knives when you put your money down today. I'm David C. Anderson from the Knife Center. That's Thomas behind the camera. We're signing off. See you next time.